sorry. So let's see, where was it? The Nuclear Science and Security Consortium is a multi institution initiative established by the National Nuclear Security Administration to train the next generation of nuclear security experts while engaging in research and development in a wide range of areas. You can see some of the research areas here on the bottom of the slide in support of the nation's non proliferation mission. And we originally established the consortium in 2011 and in 2016. And again, recently this year, I worked with Professor Yasmin to lead the successful recompetition of this award. So the NSSC now has 11 university partners, and those are listed on the map on the top right in blue and red. And then um, five national laboratory partners, and UC Berkeley is the lead institution. So, as the executive director and the director of education for the consortium, I've helped to place almost 150 uh, students and scholars into careers at the national laboratories or other government agencies. And some of those are pictured on this uh, slide here from our 2019 fall workshop. That was the last time that we were all together in person at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So rather than talk about the research of the NSSC today, I'm going to talk about my own research activities that have been largely inspired by the NSSC mission. So my research is organized around three main themes, high nuclear physics, which includes the measurement of basic physics quantities, Nuclear data analytics, which has a current focus on machine learning applications, and nuclear weapons policy. And in each of these activities, I engage students and postdocs. And so today I'm going to just give examples of a few of the different research activities that I have in these areas. First, we'll talk about um, methods for exploring, uh, quantifying nuclear deterrence phenomena, and then the implications of that for nuclear weapon policy. And then we're going to talk about the use of transfer learning and uh, low resolution motion sensors for characterizing nuclear facility operations. And then finally, we're going to talk about work that I've done at the ADH Cyclotron and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs to characterize the neutron response for organic simulators. And then I'm going to show you some applications of that. Uh, okay. Yay. So many of the questions that we seek to answer as national security analysts um, suffer from a lack of empirical data. So for example, suppose we want to understand the impact of new types of military capabilities like high precision low yield weapons on the likelihood of nuclear use. We thankfully have very little empirical data on the use of nuclear weapons in warfare. And so if we want to understand this, we have to use alternate means. So we can use what little empirical data that we do have to make inferences. There's formal models like the prisoner's dilemma that are useful in bilateral cases, but when you start to deal with multiple nuclear armed nations, you want to take into account alliances and defense packs, then these kind of approaches can become challenging. Computer simulations can be used like agent-based modeling, but then they require assumptions about human behavior, which can be difficult to predict. And then to get around this, survey experiments are conducted to try to understand how humans would behave in different wartime scenarios. But they have challenges as well because um, the pen and paper aspect of the survey can fail to make the scenario salient for the respondent because they bear no cause for their decision. And a lot of the traditional approaches suffer generally from what's known as the complexity scarcity gap, where formal models are too complex to be constructed accurately, but then empirical data are limited to non-existent. And so the question is, how do we bridge this gap? So um, a few years ago, I served as the director for the project on nuclear gaming. Uh, which was an effort in collaboration with Santia, Livermore, and UC Berkeley to establish a new method for um, answering questions in national security where empirical data are limited to non existent. And we introduced this concept of experimental war gaming, where the idea is that you conduct a war game 
but in a um, in a controlled treatment setting where with, for the purpose of hypothesis testing. And so we have a board game and an online game. You basically take a number of different games in one setting, you conduct them, and then you change one variable, you conduct a bunch of more games, and then you quantify the change in behavior. And this concept was published in Science in 2018. And so our first experimental board game was Signal. Some of you have seen the early stages of this work. It's a three-player game. This was an online board designed to look at online board designed to look at a clear ad in a multipolar world. So what does that mean? In this case, we have three countries: green, orange, and purple. Two of them have nuclear weapons, and then they can interact in the game environment using economic, diplomatic, or military needs. So an example of that, so this shows the kind of interaction in the game environment where the green player is executing a, so they have a signaling token there, they indicate that they're gonna take the action, they confirm that they wanna do that, they send in their army. In this case, they were successful and they took the food resource. So the question that we wanna examine in this game is what is the impact of the introduction of tailored nuclear weapons into the arsenal? Or how does the likelihood of nuclear use change with tailored nuclear weapons like high precision low yield weapons in the arsenal? And why is this interesting? So in the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, they called for the introduction of low yield submarine launched warheads and those um, weapons were introduced into the arsenal just last year. So this is the um, setup where we have the control group where they only have access to traditional high yield nuclear weapons. And then we have the treatment group where they have both the high yield nuclear weapons as well as the tailored weapons. And you can see the number of cases that we had in each category. So how do we analyze these data? We use, uh, low jet model and so what you have are basically two dichotomous variables so we want to quantify the probability that nuclear weapons were used in the game and so that's illustrated in this cartoon on the y-axis so they either were used or they were not and you're going to get a zero or one and then on the x-axis this is representative of the variable that you're trying to quantify in this case the um, treatment conditions. So in the zero, they only had the high yield weapons available. And if X is one, they also have the tailored nuclear weapons. And so what's neat about this logic model is that you can also add a number of different demographic covariates. And so the estimate of this coefficient gives you indication of whether or not there was an increased likelihood of nuclear use with the introduction of that covariate. So there's a couple of different models here. Um, and in model one, we're only looking at the impact of the Taylor nuclear weapons. And then in the other models, basically they're all just different subsets of the different demographic covariates. So looking at things like the gender of the players in the game, the education level, their age, their experience with national security issues, their politics, and it's really hard to see on this. So you, if you, if this projector was better, you would be able to see little lines showing the scale here. Um, so really a positive value of this estimate indicates an increased likelihood of nuclear use. And while it is difficult to see, the tailored um, weapons do increase the likelihood of nuclear use, but it is not a statistically significant finding. The error bars here on this plot are huge. And so um, ultimately this isn't particularly satisfying. And so what we did was we also conducted a survey experiment where we put the respondents in the same kinds of scenarios that they would be wrestling with in the war game environment. And you can see the scale a little bit better here. Note that the axis has changed and the zero point is here. We only have two models in this case. One where we just look at the question of the impact of tailored nuclear weapons, and then the other where we also include the demographic covariance. And you can see here that there is a positive, statistically significant increase in the likelihood of nuclear use with the tailored um, weapons in the arsenal. 
So these results are kind of interesting because they have maybe show limited support for the hypothesis that these tailored nuclear weapons increase the likelihood of use. But the magnitude of what I think what's really interesting from a methodological perspective is that the magnitude of the effect is really different in the two data generating processes. And so this has important implications for the use of survey experiments or experimental wargaming for social science inquiry, because we're really finding different results and different effects in the different um, simulated environments. And so this work um, is in the process of being published in the Journal of Peace Research, which is a top tier political science journal, which was also a really interesting experience for me to learn how to write. I mean, I mean in terms of, sorry, can I ask, just jump in? Sure. Um, so, I mean, that's a nice academic exercise, but I think in order to really make use of it, you have to explain a little more detail what is the context. And so, and the question is, who is our game with your participant? Who is your participant or your player? And why is it relevant in terms of ultimately once the people get power? Like how do they actually represent some the ultimately the, the authority to actually do something? And then certainly do something. And then certainly what I mean there's a lot of consequences to be kind of more tactical, but it's certainly very relevant right now, absolutely. But I mean how relevant is your exercise really ultimately the real world? That's why. That's fundamentally my question because there has to be a lot of different degrees of penalties and response to these kind of effects that you need to take into account for people to decide whether it's beneficial. That's, that's so, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to talk about a lot of things today, and so the disadvantage of that is I'm not going to have time to get into everything in a lot of depth. But what I will say um, to your point about the um, external validity of the wargame environment is that one of the advantages of experimental wargaming is that we don't need to fully simulate the um, real world environment because what we're only quantifying within the simulated environment. So we don't need all of the effects of the real world to be accurate. But if the effects of in the game environment are pushing the player towards certain decision making that wouldn't be reflected in a real world environment, then that does have game effects that can introduce biases. To your point about the demographic characteristics of the players, this is a huge factor. It's a big study in political science, and I wasn't going to get into a whole lot of it. But what's interesting is you can also see we find a statistically significant increased likelihood of use for people who have more right-leaning politics. And this is something that is not just shown in, in our study, but also Scott Sagan is a political scientist at Stanford. He's shown this as well. The question of whether or not you can use the war game results from random people that are playing the game versus um, if, whether or not you need to have senior military leaders, this has also been a source of debate in the political science literature. And so rather than um, coming down with a response to that, we just said, let's try to measure it. And so we looked at, for example, people with significant national security experience, people with high reported knowledge. We um, played the game at the Pentagon. We played the game with senior leaders at Stratcom. And so the results of the game outcomes are all anonymized, but we do have sufficient data just based upon the demographic um, characteristics to be able to look at, is there a statistically significant difference in behavior when we have these elites? But then it comes down to how do you define an elite player? Because some say, okay, it's the senior military leaders that are the elite. And so then some quantify based on their knowledge on national security issues. So um, I think it's an open question. And it's one that could also, I mean, it's, it's important in order for us to really um, use experimental wargaming for national security problem solving. I think it, these are the types of questions that we need to be able to answer in addition to why are we getting different results when different data generating processes. Thanks. I mean, again, the context is really important. That, that really helps enormously. I mean, it's just interesting, national security, right? Yes. Right. Enormous uncertainty, though even the experts ultimately don't agree. Right? And so. and this is self-reported. So if we were to adjudicate what their their kind of propensity for national security work, given their CV or something like that, then maybe these data would look different. One of the uh, those are very wide hair bars. <laughs> um, 
one of the ways that you can uh, narrow error bars is by increasing the sample size. Is that an option here? So definitely for the survey experiment, for the war game, it was much harder than we realized that it was going to be, I think, to collect a large data set. And it is still the largest data set of its kind. There's no um, war game data set in the political science literature that um, has more samples than this one. But it was still extremely difficult because in this case, we needed three players to start a game. And so already, so each one of this is done on the game level analysis. We also look at a per player analysis where we have more statistics because we have three times the number of players for every game that we have. But even still, the conclusion that we reach is ultimately the same. We don't see any kind of statistically significant increase in the likelihood of nuclear use with tailored effects weapons present in the war game environment. And um, so if there is an effect there, at least based on the study that we've done, it's small. So more recently, um, I've been looking at a different, a new question related to cyber deterrence um, using experimental wargaming in collaboration with Sandia National Laboratories through a LDRD project that was funded there. So imagine that you have two actors, red and blue. In order for blue to establish an effective deterrent, they need to communicate a credible threat to red. And there's this thing called uh, the communication capability trade-off. It's a, it's a postulated phenomenon in cyber deterrence, where the more you communicate about your capability, the more the adversary is going to understand that you have this capability, and so the more they're going to be deterred. But the more you communicate about your capability, you also have the potential to degrade the effectiveness of your deterrent. And that's mediated through two main mechanisms muting where as you communicate about your capability then the adversary knows about it so they can prepare defenses and this can then either degrade or completely undermine the effectiveness of your capability and then mirroring as you communicate about your capability then the adversary understands that this capability exists and then they can create a comparable capability and use it in an offensive scenario so what we're doing right now is we're looking at this question of the impact of the specificity of the threat and the domain on the likelihood of deterrent success or failure. So we're looking at uh, both vague and specific threats in conventional cyber and nuclear domains to try to sample different areas where the communication capability trade-off would be more or less significant. So for example, in the nuclear domain, we don't expect the muting and mirroring mechanisms that I talked about to be relevant. Whereas in the cyber domain, there really is a question, a real conundrum for the adversary or the actor to whether or not to reveal or conceal their capability. And we're using, we're in the process right now of designing an experimental war game to look at this question. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about my work in multi thinking but I'm going to start with some background. So this slide shows a graphical representation of the nuclear weapons fuel cycle. And as many of you know, the same uh, processes that are relevant for civilian nuclear energy generation are also here. So for example, for the production of highly enriched uranium, you have mining and milling and enrichment, things that you see in a civilian cycle. Um, for the production of weapons grade plutonium, which is shown in, in yellow and green here, you, the highly enriched uranium is fabricated into fuel and then that's loaded into the reactor. And then the reactor operations can be optimized for the production of weapons grade plutonium. So, my team has been working to develop technical measures to ensure that nuclear reactors around the globe are being operated in a manner consistent with um, civilian nuclear energy production. And so this work is, I've been leading a project at 
uh, Berkeley lab. This is a multi-lab effort, so Sandia and UC Berkeley are teams, as well as the Air Force Institute of Technology, and the project is called Snitches, um, Sensor Networks to Identify Transferable Classification Heuristics for Enhanced Security. And the idea is how do, can we use low resolution, non-radiological multi-sensing to characterize nuclear reactor operation. And so you build a machine learning model at a test bed facility where you have ground truth available, but you wanna be able to apply that at a target facility where you can collect data, but you don't have operational logs available. So the big challenge with snitches is how do we develop a transferable machine learning model that we can trust? And first I'm gonna tell you about the data. So we collect data using the Merlin multi-sensor platform. So it collects a number of different data products. They're listed on the slide here. This is kind of a next generation for those who saw my previous talk of the Canary platform. And um, we, it collects data at 16 hertz. There's also a GPS, so you have location information. Um, all of the hardware is from commercial off-the-shelf components and they're encased in a weatherproof enclosure that's shown on the top and then they're mounted at the facility and they have these little sun shields and then we place these sensor networks at two different nuclear facilities. Um, we have more but I'm just going to focus on these two. Uh, HIFER, which is the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory which serves as a test bed facility. And so this is where the reactor is and then there's a reprocessing center that's over here and then you can also see what the cooling tower which is really not the um, hyperbolic iconic shape that you would imagine it's a cooling rack with a series of fans and then each one of the yellow dots we that's where we have the sensor and then our target facility for this demonstration is the trigger reactor at the McClellan Nuclear Research Center and this is just outside of Sacramento and you can see just based on the pictures that the scale of the facility is really different. We have five sensors deployed here. You can see the one fan versus the four at Hyper. Hyper is like 85 megawatt reactor, whereas the um, MNRC is one megawatt nominal. It's also pulsed. So while we are collecting the same data products at the two different facilities, the size, the operations, the scale, the specific equipment is different. And so the signatures of the operations phenomena that we're interested in, classifying like reactor operations, could be very different. And so we have developed this uh, transductive transfer learning method for characterizing operations at the target facility. And so this is a kind of simplified schematic of that approach. So if you look on the left, let's just start with the label testbed data. So first we can use that label testbed data to train a machine learning model, I'm going to call it the base model, for characterization of operations at the testbed facility. We can also take that data and feed it into a proxy label generator along with unlabeled data from the target facility. And so there we can look at shared embedded features in the data set and use that to assign pseudo labels or proxy labels on the target data. And I'm gonna talk about how we do that in just a minute. Now we have these proxy label target data. We can continue to train the base machine learning model through incremental learning, continuing to adjust the weights and biases for improved classification performance at the target. So first I'm gonna tell you about the base model. This is also hard to see, but this is supposed to look like a feed-forward neural network. And so this is just an example of one of the network architectures we have where we have 13 different input nodes, and those correspond to the different sensing modalities on the Merlin. And then the data are fed in, they're weighted, they're biased. That um, is passed as input to an activation function whose output is propagated forward in the network. That happens for every node and then for every layer in the network until you get to the terminates. And then there you have, in this example, binary classification where we're looking at whether or not the reactor is on or off. And so you have a softmax activation function, you reach a, a binary determination of zero or one, compare that to the known reactor labels, and then 
um, the degree to which your network has misclassified the operational state that you're interested in is used to adjust the weights and biases, and you do this in an iterative fashion until your model is optimized. And so that is what we did for the hyper data. And so this is an example of the kind of accuracy that we received, as well as the Matthews correlation coefficient, which is a measure of the performance of the model which is particularly useful when you have high class imbalance. So here, if you, what I mean by that is um, you have, in our case, you have two classes for this example. The reactor's either on or off. And so the prevalence quantifies that, which means that 60% of the time, roughly, the reactor is on. But if the reactor was on 90% of the time, and I just guessed it was on all of the time, then my accuracy would be 90%, but I wouldn't necessarily know anything about what was going on at the facility. And so what's nice about the Matthews correlation coefficient is it uh, takes into account false positives and false negatives and gives you a measure of the correlation between the predicted and the known labels. And so it's similar to a correlation coefficient in that it varies from minus one to one. So a value of 0.7 or above corresponds to a very strong positive correlation between the known and the predicted labels. Okay, so this is great. Um, so far we haven't transferred it. Um, this is a Matthews correlation coefficient as a function of the number of sensing modalities used in the assessment. And so this was done using recursive feature addition where you iteratively train the model on one input and then you'd go through all the different inputs, find the one that provided the most information to the model, retain that, and then iteratively train on two and three and so on until you form a ranked list of the importance of the different features. And then you can see how the trend in the classification performance changes as you include more sensing modalities in the assessment. And so we developed a software base to do this work as well, um, mimosas. And so you notice here the most important um, input features are the three different vector components of the magnetic field. And the sensor that, data that we're looking at here was located close to the cooling tower, so that can make sense that we're picking up on the fans there. Um, the challenge with the three magnetic field vector components is that in order to apply this model to a target facility, we would need to align the vector components to have a kind of reasonable transfer. So instead what we do is we take the vector magnitude of the magnetic field, also the acceleration, which is less important. And so there you can see that once we do this, you have a, same, a similar type of plot, similar type of trend. The accuracy decreases for classification at the test bed facility. The Matthews correlation coefficient is still a positive correlation between the known and predicted labels. And so, but this model gives us more of a basis for transfer to the other facility. So how does that transfer work? So recall, we have labels at the test bed data, but we do not have labels at the target data. So we can look at different engineered features at the test bed data. So for example, the variance of the magnetic field, and then see how that separates with the operations phenomena that we're interested in. And we can quantify that using a clustering algorithm. And so we did that here for the variance of the acceleration magnitude, the variance of the magnetic field magnitude. And you can see that we actually get pretty clear separation between the reactor off and on state. And so we can apply the same transformation and clustering algorithm to the target data, but we don't have labels available there. But instead, we know that um, from, we can create a heuristic, a map between the cluster position based on a distance to the origin heuristic that allows us to assign proxy labels to the target data. So that's illustrated here. So we have the cluster that's closest to the origin here, corresponds to reactor off. Same here, um, and then the clusters that are further from the origin corresponding to reactor on. The distributions are very different. It seems um, odd that this would work, but it does. And we've shown it not just in the binary 
case, but we're currently working on a multi-class case as well. So then, okay, and it's not perfect. We've got a um, proxy labeling accuracy of around 88%. So we take these proxy labels, but we have labels on a, a facility that we have no access to. And so then we can take these, ingest them back into the base model that was trained at the test bed facility, and then we can continue to adjust the weights and biases in the model. We can selectively freeze and free different layers in the machine learning model to try to retain more or less information from the test bed with the goal of improving the classification performance of the target. And this slide shows the results of this. So if I just took the base model that I trained at the test bed facility and applied it to the target data, this would be the classification performance that I would get. So an accuracy of 20% and a negative Matthews correlation coefficient. That's bad. That's why we're doing transfer learning. That's why we need other methods to be able to transfer the model. If we do the transductive transfer learning that I just talked about, either leaving all layers free or freezing the first layer, then we can significantly increase the classification accuracy at the target facility as well as the Matthews correlation coefficient. And so this is just for the reactor operational state that I've shown you now, but we're currently working on extending this to a multi-class situation where we can look at reactor power levels, which becomes a much more challenging problem because the um, distribution of the reactor power level, you have very few um, events where the reactor is being operated at a low power state. And then, so, and then distinguishing them in that cluster space is also more challenging, but we've made great progress on that as well. So um, this work was submitted for publication. Some of the classification um, work of the hyper facility was submitted along with a method for sensor importance in these multi-sensor networks to machine learning with applications. And this was a student that I worked with in the computer science department who graduated last year. And these methods are useful for pattern matching and um, dealing with large data sets, things that are useful for nuclear physics analyses as well. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So this is the last segment I'm going to talk about our work in uh, fast neutron detection and in particular in the characterization and application of organic scintillators. So an organic scintillator is a material that emits light when excited by ionizing radiation. And so you have gamma ray come in, then the primary secondary particle that's causing excitation and ionization in the scintillator for the energy range of gammas that we're interested in is a Compton electron. And then for fast neutrons, the primary mechanism for light generation in the scintillator is through NP elastic scattering. And so if we look at the light that's being produced as a function of energy deposited in the scintillator for these two secondary particles, you can see that the electron light at high energy is approximately linear. Um, the proton light, however, is not. And the shape and the magnitude of this curve depends upon the scintillating medium. There is no physical model describing the proton light yield, no physical model that we can use to predict the light based on the ionization quenching phenomena that are happening in the scintillator right now. So if we want to know the neutron response of the organic scintillator, we have to measure it. And so we've been doing this work at the 88 inch cyclotron, um, making neutrons using deuteron breakup. And so we have a uh, Deuterons from the cyclotron and they're accelerated and steered through a series of switching and bending magnets and impinged upon a breakup target in the cyclotron ball. And so the deuterons smash into a breakup target and then protons are stopped over a very short distance. Neutrons go flying in the forward direction and they're collimated through a series of uh, concrete and sandbags of a couple meters. And what results is a broad spectrum open air neutron beam in the experimental case where we can put our scintillators and then we can make our measurements. And this is an example of the uh, neutron spectrum that we measured at the cyclotron. This is the number of neutrons per microcoulomb per stradium per MeV as a function of neutron energy. 
And one of the things that this illustrates is the flexibility of our neutron source, because we can tune different deuteron energies at the cyclotron. So this is for a 16 MeV deuteron beam. And then we can put in different breakup target materials. And so we can really um, modify and, and adjust the shape of the spectrum for different applications. And so now I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you a top down view of the Cave Zero experimental area. So the neutrons come in through a Capcom window into the cave, and then we can put the simulator that we're interested in targeting or in characterizing it as a target in the beam. And so from the um, time difference between the deuterons impinging on the breakup target and the events in the target scintillator, we can measure the energy of the incident neutron. And then the neutrons can undergo reactions like in P elastic scattering in the target. And then we also have an array of observation detectors where we can measure the energy of the scattered neutron by looking at the time difference between events in the target and the observation detector. And then we also know the angle where we place the detector. And so from that, we have a kinematically overconstrained system where we can calculate the proton recoil energy in the target scintillator using multiple different methods. And this allows us to obtain a continuous measurement of the light yield of the scintillator as a function of proton recoil energy over a broad range of energies in a single measurement. And this is work that I built with Josh Brown during his time as a graduate student here. And I've since uh, turned this to a program across multiple agencies and measured a bunch of different materials. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the materials that we have characterized over the past few years. We've looked at organic crystals. So the trans still beam, which has an anisotropic light output and is very bright, has good pull shape discrimination. We've looked at still being built by Benzel, which is a, a scintillator that was developed by Natalia Zaitseva at Livermore for use in neutron time of flight diagnostics at the National Ignition Facility. We've looked at a number of different organic liquids like EJ309, which is a pulse shape discriminating liquid commonly used for nuclear physics measurement. Uh, we've recently characterized the response of LAD, PPO, and the water based liquid scintillator which are interesting materials for large volume neutrino detectors. We've looked at plastic organic scintillators like EJ200, which is a fast plastic that's of interest for compact kinematic neutron imaging. And EJ276, which is the only commercially available uh, PSD capable plastic that we then compared to novel materials developed in the lab like uh, we're working now on analyzing this lithium loaded triple PSD plastic that was also developed by Natalia. And then we've looked at Sandia's organic glass. So, those of you who have seen my presentation in the department previously, I'm not going to go through all of that again and show you a bunch of proton Lego plots. But if you are excited about this, and I am, then you can go back and look at that uh, YouTube video on my website. This is just a papers that we published in the past, this is a subset really of the papers that we published in the past two years on this work. But today what I'm going to talk about instead is an extension of this method that we recently demonstrated and then an application of it. So in addition to neutrons um, interacting on protons in the scintillator, they can also undergo elastic scattering with carbon atoms that are present. And so you can, if you place your detectors at forward angle, then um, MP elastic scattering is kinematically constrained forward angle, so you can see those. But if you put them at backward angles, you can also see the light generated by carbon recoil. And so this is a cartoon of that concept. This is the, our experimental setup. And that's exactly what we did now using carbon elastic scattering kinematics to identify the events in the time of flight space. And so this is a plot of that result. This is the light yield. So the light number of photons relative to the number of photons produced by a 477 keV electron, which comes from the complement of a cesium-137 source. 
as a function of the particle recoil. And this measurement was done for EJ204, which is a plastic organic scintillator. It is the first measurement of the carbon light yield of a plastic organic scintillator. And that's shown in these black dots here. But what's neat, because we can put the detectors at forward and backward angles, we can get the proton light yield in the same measurement. That's shown in the black squares here. And if you compare that to previous proton light yield measurements that we've made on different detectors, and that's shown in the open red squares here, and we get agreement between those measurements over the full energy range that we covered. And then in addition on this plot, I also have the electron light output. The solid curve shows what a linear electron response would be, which I mentioned earlier. The dashed curve shows what it actually is, and that was measured by Payne et al. So it's not, it's not really um, linear. And the degree to which that um, nonlinearity is um, important increases as the particle energy decreases. And this can become significant, and it also varies for different organic scintillators. And so while we didn't measure it for this setup, we could. If, uh, using these detectors in this whole deck with a hot gamma ray source. I'm interested in doing that as well. And this work was published in JSRFC um, earlier this year. And so now I'm going to talk about an application of the proton light yield measurement that we just published yesterday in the physics of plasmas with uh, Lawrence Livermore Upshot. So the picture on the left is of the fuse device, which is a a uh, device that was built for studying sheared flow stabilization of z pinch plasmas in a fusion regime. So that's a lot of words, but basically what you need to know is you have a neutral deuterium gas and you inject that and then ionize it into this one meter long acceleration region. And then the, um, the ionized, um, material is accelerated through a coaxial electrode arrangement and then it assembles into a z pinch plasma in this assembly region and so within z pinch plasmas there are instabilities that can occur where large electric fields can drive ion beams in the plasma so that you can get um, beam target fusion reactions for deuterium plasmas um, as opposed to the kind of controlled thermonuclear fusion that we, you would like to see as we develop towards fusion energy systems. And so what we did with Livermore was used our knowledge of the proton light yield to develop a diagnostic to characterize the presence of beam target fusion in the um, fused device. And so we have two different organic scintillators placed at different angles. This is just a cartoon showing the um, Z pinch plasma column. And so we want to look at the neutron spectra at the two different angles and then use that information and how those are different to get back to information about the deuteron beam energy in the plasma and then ultimately whether or not it was beam target or thermonuclear. So the way that we did that, well, let me just say, this is a plot of the light output and this is simulated as a function of deuteron energy. And so the negative uh, deuteron energy corresponds to a deuteron going in the other direction. It's not negative energy. So the way that we did this was using a JON simulation where we sample the deuteron energy. And then from that, we sample the neutron angular distribution. And we have an analytical relationship so that we can calculate the neutron energy for a given deuteron energy. Then we transport those neutrons and then they can interact in our scintillator. And then from that, we have the energy deposition spectra, which we convert to light output using the previously measured proton light yield relation. And that's how you get these plots. And so these are at two different angles around the device chamber. Then we have the measured data at those two angles. And that's what's shown here. This is the count as a function of scintillator light output measured at one angle then at the other um, you can see that the statistics are poor and then the, each of these different curves corresponds to the simulated response for different deuteron beam energies in the plasma so 0 10 and 20 kb 
And so what we did was we used a simultaneous minimization between the experimental and the simulated uh, data or simulated results allowing the deuteron beam energy to flow and when we minimize the deuteron beam energy and we determined the uh, optimal value of uh, 4.65 kdv with the associated statistical and systematic uncertainty shown here which is consistent with the production of thermonuclear fusion in the fused device um, which is really exciting to do, not just from a fusion energy perspective, but also to be able to use the results that we um, have measured and you know we've been pointing towards all of these applications and to actually be able to work on demonstrating them. But also to be able to help advance fusion energy systems because they have the potential to be um, decreased proliferation risks relative to the fusion energy system. And so today I've shown you a variety of different research activities in applied nuclear physics and data analytics and nuclear weapons policy. And I want to close with this quote from Charles Ferguson, who was the former head of the, uh, he was the president of the Federation of American Scientists, and he uh, is now at the National Academies. And he says, every nuclear scientist and engineer is an action hero. And I want to remind people that it was the scientists who first built the atomic bomb and the seeds of that work happening here at UC Berkeley on our campus. And this is a letter that at the time Einstein read, uh, wrote to then President Roosevelt, where he talks about the promise and the potential peril of nuclear energy. And so at the time, there was a real um, responsibility that was that there was an awareness of Einstein and other scientists about um, ensuring that the technological fruits of our labor are used for the benefit of society. And I believe that this is important and I'm excited moving forward to work with um, students and research here, as well as in the classroom to develop the nuclear science action heroes of tomorrow. <laughs> That's you guys. So I want to thank the sponsors for their support of this work. I want to recognize a large team of students and scientists who collaborated on this. And I want to thank you for your time and attention. No, but that's a really interesting question, and I haven't thought about it. And I had a, I had a question about the scintillator. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know what role lithium has in the scintillating system? Yeah, so it's really pretty cool. So lithium acts as a capture agent, and so then you can see the um, products from the capture, which I think is an alpha and a triton. And so then you have just in the same way that the proton where you're the recoiling protons causing excitation and ionization, the alpha and the triton can as well, but you get a kind of capture peak as opposed to this distribution from the, um, because the neutron can deposit up to all of its energy in a single collision with the proton, but um, you have a, depending upon the angle of scatter, a distribution of energies that could be deposited. Whereas with the capture reaction, you have a peak. And so you can see, you get uh, sensitivity for incoming neutrons from the thermal all the way up to the fast neutrons that you would see for uh, primarily through elastic scattering interaction. And is that dependent on the medium that uh, lithium puts in? Or is it strictly a... Lithium can do, stew, you know, lithium can capture, but if you want to make light, you're going to need to, you know, have it surrounded by scintillating molecules. 
I think that that cyber uh, example that you gave, the cyber book, is really cool. I think that um, I can imagine some of that being applicable, not just to nation state, nation state interactions, but to non proliferation scenarios and non state actors. Right. <clears throat> Do you think, I mean, in fact, I know of one example where they're happy to talk about it, the history operas program, because we want to deter protection. Have people looked at using this for a, a part of a non proliferation regime, not with state actors, but with non state actors? Let me just say that in case I misspoke that I'm speaking solely for myself and not on behalf of Sandia or whatever they're doing, but um, we have explored looking at um, whether or not to include proxy actors as well as um, you know, nation state actors in the game and the degree to which we need to gamify those relationships in order to look at the impact of deterrent deterrent success or failure and part of that comes down to the question of attribution which has been a big question um, in cyber deterrence and then even if you are able to attribute the degree to which that matters in terms of a conflict scenario if a proxy proxy actor is the one that's mediating the cyber attack uh, i guess it's outside of cyber attack for nuclear deterrence as well and there's an action you create something you make it well known that you have particular deterrent. You know, the non-state actors try to respond in some way and you have to trigger a response that will produce some signature of their intent. I mean, I can imagine how you could gain it. I wonder if you say look at that. You mean will the non-state actors try to respond um, in terms of developing a nuclear capability? No, well, they're in their attempt to hide off the future. Okay. From a nuclear perspective? So so they want to create a new, they want to try and you say, look, we're going to use this tool for attribution purposes. Mm -hmm. And they respond by trying to come up with a way to circumvent what they're doing. Yeah, so I think the, the nuclear forensics capability in general, right, that it, there was a heavy focus on post detonation forensics, but then it was like in the um, 90s, 2000s, where there was a bill that was passed um, in part because of a lot of lobbying that was happening and language that was being written by scholars at the time, including in arms control today, that talked about the use of pre detonation nuclear forensics or attribution and as a as a deterrent really to point back to even if it is um, being diverted from a state facility that the state is responsible for maintaining effective nuclear material security and so um, I could that I mean I think that that's an interesting question to gamify as well yeah I, I have a question of not the light yield measurement. Uh, when the thing where you actually broke it down, it looked like your light yield measurement got more undefined at higher energy levels. Uh, is that the case? Uh, you had a really good line at the beginning of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. towards the end, it kind of took a little bit there. Maybe this? Uh, no, a few, few slides back, though. Uh... Hmm. This? No, it's the one where you're talking about being zero. Uh, the, the, oh, yeah, that's the, background. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, so in order to, it's actually kind of tricky and it's it's neat that it works. I mean, what there's a complication here in that the cyclotron is a pulse source, and so we don't actually have a clear determination of the incoming time of flight on mm -hmm. of the cyclotron. We have um, we know damn well the time uh, pick off for the events in the target simulator, and then we have uh, ambiguity in which beam pulse the cyclotron was, uh, or the, the um, of the cyclotron that the event was associated with. So we know it modulo the cyclotron period, and so what we can do because we have this kinematically overconstrained system is that we can calculate the energy of the incoming neutron using, for example, this method, as well as this method. And then we can 
um, look at the map, at a match, a kinematic match window to identify what we think the cyclotron period offset was on an event by event basis. But there's some uncertainty associated with that. And so even after applying that kinematic match constraint for single NP elastic scattering, some of the background still bleeds into our plot here. So these are mis misattributed or, or multiple scatters. But then when we go to the proton light yield measurements that we show, uh, we can still, we're determining the light output. Like for example, let me go here. So here we have, I keep going in the wrong way, different points on this curve, right? So those represent a characterization of that two-dimensional distribution. And so there, because we have both an energy constraint, we take a you know bin and energy as well as a light constraint because we're only seeing the light output distribution in that region in the 2D space, mm -hmm. then the background contributors aren't biasing that assessment. Wait, what is the question? Okay, so we tried to do that in the signal game, um, and we were able to get a lot of players from India. Um, and so we did that. We had a couple of different paid mechanisms. So we did um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And so there we were able to get players um, from other countries, primarily India. And then we uh, paid players to participate through the, there's like an X lab on campus. And then we also had convenient sample where we set up different gaming environments. Um, we don't have really enough data at this point to adjudicate the differences which, uh, in behavior that might arise from different countries. But I, I think that that would be interesting and we tried to do it. It's hard because even with the rel the relatively large data set that we have, looking at a question like the probability of nuclear use in the game, we just don't for for this um, addition of tailored effect weapon, we don't have statistical power to look at that. So even if we were to add a demographic covariate, we're not going to be able to see it. But we may be able to look at other questions in a game environment and then start to answer um, or start to ask some of those as well. We talked to people at DARPA during the early parts of this, and they were also interested in trying to understand intent and then trying to understand um, intent as a function of culture. And I think that that is something that we could develop a, a game to try to look at. And you could put it on Facebook, and everybody likes to play the Facebook game. Um, I know, but, um, excellent presentation. Thank you very much for this. Um, I have two questions. How many, you talk about the, the data set, how many approximate uh, players have you had for the game? So, let's see. So, the number of games that I showed was about 400 and something, a little bit more, 450 games. And then we have three players within that. So, three times that, that's 1,200. But that's just a subset of all of the games that we had because we only took games where that um, all players stayed for the full game, uh, that the game continued through at least three rounds, and then we had some other kind of criteria to identify this as a good game. And so I would say that probably about, oh, and the other criterion was we required that they have a demographic survey available. And that was a big cut. So half of the plays that we had did not have a demographic survey. So we've had thousands, which is cool. And you can play the game now. So if you go to pong.berkeley.edu and you click on uh, play the game, then you just need two friends and then you can go online and play the game. So then my follow up really quickly was how long is the average duration of the game? It can be long. So it, it is um, designed to be a bit of a commitment. I would say it's uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Cool, thank you.
about it so initially we thought about building an AI player so that we only required two players for the game but in order to do that in a way that doesn't bias the experiment that was a challenge and then to quantify the potential bias was also a challenge so we thought for the first round that we wouldn't introduce that yet but one of the added benefits of having the gameplay data is that we could develop an AI and we could develop based on you know, the uh, empirics of the player behavior that we have now. And we could tailor that for someone who has more national security experience or an older player. So, I mean, that, I think that's a fun thing. And since your experiment involves humans, you have to go through an ethics review board. Yes. Order, and, and what sort of the risk space? Well, you have to make sure that you're not hurting them, that the, you know, that the, that you tell them about the risks associated with the research, like there's always a risk that the information could become public. And your, um, your role as the experiment leader in those human subjects experiments is to protect and anonymize the data. But even if you do, you know, even if you do everything you're supposed to be doing, accidents can happen. And so you have to tell them about that risk. And then you have to ensure that the experiment is designed in a way to not harm the human. And so we did that with the um, Institutional Review Board. And through both UC Berkeley and the DOE review in order to get the game approved. And for cyber so far, we just fielded the survey experiment. But then we're going to use the information from that to start to design a video game as well. So is there a way in which the, the, the experience of playing this game, not the knowledge of the player's game from playing this game, is there no way that they would either be changed in their behavior or be impacted or at risk by the knowledge that they just learned? Is that, was that the conclusion, the conclusion of the IRB? No, I mean, I think that they could be. And I think that that's one of the things that we looked at actually was how does the behavior change as a function of the number of times that you've played the game? And so that was another cut that we made in terms of um, calling the data set for analysis was because most of the games that we had were first time players. So we just looked at that. But like, for example, people who don't know about um, national security issues may not think about developing a defense pact with their neighbor or offering a nuclear umbrella, whereas players who studied nuclear weapons issues would sit down and say, hey, let's all not nuke each other and we can, you know, and so that kind of um, experience of playing the game in particular, who you're playing the game with can influence future So we talked, so we talked about that in the science article and um, yes, we've thought about it. We haven't done it. It's complicated um, in terms of doing it through DOE. And um, you know, setting up the permissions for commercial relationships. There's also a spin-off company that I'm working with that's trying to do this um, in an industry setting uh, for and and not really for analyzing existing game data, but for working with companies to be able to help them use their game data for targeting, for example. But um, that is people have tried to do that not with civilization but um with another game environment and there was a report that came out of sandia where they looked at um something some question related to oh i know what it was uh the impact of, of money and it was the influence between uh, economics and nuclear conflict and i think that that's really interesting the challenge of taking the existing data is that 
you don't have control over the experimental environment. And so your ability to draw a conclusion from a scientific method perspective is limited. But I don't think that that means that you shouldn't do it. What we should do is really get with these companies to be able to um, get permission to implement experiments or to build our own, like I said, and deploy those experiments on Facebook. But you would need some kind of consent. One last question, Lee. So, since you've got the carbon molecules in there, I mean, I get that you're obviously it's a lot lower for the proton light like, you know, It looks like if you get the sun energy, but the electron, like the proportion is even higher. Do you want to really look at design simulators for a purpose free nuclear process that goes on? Neutron simulators, right? But the nuclear process that goes on would create kind of 200 kg electrons. Like in other words, your your process would create basically like a neutron to external conversion just because the light would be so much brighter. Oh, you mean a neutron induced yeah. reaction? Yeah. 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 Mediates a neutron signal through an electron secondary particle. It's an interesting idea. The challenge is that you are almost always in a gamma bath in a neutron detection scenario. And so then you would be stuck with the discrimination problem between which electrons came from my neutron mediated reaction versus which one came from my gamma ray interaction. It's a lifetime though. It's a nuclear decay process just like a life in there. And you'd be effectively putting your own like cell data out there. You know what I'm saying? So it's um, a lifetime on the state that then converts. Yeah, I do, but theory. it depends on the rate of the source in the environment. Because if you then had interact, you know, if the time between interactions was such that you were getting new neutron and or gamma ray interactions, then it would be difficult. I mean, what's nice now is that because you have different recoil particles that correspond to the different incident ionizing radiation then you can use the differences in the density of the excited states in the scintillator to be able to differentiate between the type of particle that was causing the excitation. So um, for so protons- the 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 Well, people sort of do that with Inverse beta decay in the yeah, sense, right. yeah. So, so, like that, except that here, like four neutron DC reaction, positive type of energy that's in light time, yeah. Yeah, you have a, a similar type of tag to what you're talking about in inverse beta decay, but you have a time delay mm -hmm. between, yeah. So, then that can, I mean, for neutrinos, it doesn't matter because the time between events is very long, but for a neutron detection scenario, I mean, part of what we've been trying to do more is to push into the regime where we can go into higher and higher flux environments, like with the S talk. Right, so if you're not, if you're not trying to go to higher flux, right. you can do the simulation, you might as well get the energy there for the Or if we, so one of the things that we're doing that I didn't talk about is we've been looking at different models of ionization quenching to be able to try to understand what is different about the simulators that you get different ionization quenching behavior. And so if we can understand that, then we can tune a simulator to be able to exploit the differences in that capability and then drive the PSD down to lower and lower recoil particle energies. So we could potentially use the same mechanism for um, for interaction, basically for conversion of the neutron energy into a detectable signal. Um, if we can understand and exploit that ionization quenching relationship. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bethany. Uh, yeah, very exciting. Thank you. And uh, I think you're, you're around a little bit, right? Say it again. You're around a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Just one email. There's just this one question from chat. Uh, thank you for that support.
Was the work done with carbon and coal ideal, or are you interested in the saving and Yes, I am. Um, oh, 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 are they there? Still there? Uh, oh, Ruby just left. Oh, oh, they are. Okay, I know who that is. I think that's why they measured it for their undergrad. Um, do you remember?